Okay, before continuing the last lecture about uh, how to move the location of the right half plane 0 to the left, uh, I answered one of the questions, uh, uh, which is always the question, uh, what is the issue with uh, creating a 0 and then uh, cancelling it with a non-dominant pole, which will be desirable. So, this is a technique and it is used and uh, as we saw, in fact, it can lead uh, to a lot of improvement in the bandwidth and eventually we can shift the uh, unit again frequency. So, but only we have to be careful that uh, this mismatch between uh, pole and zero is not uh, too much. So, because of the process variations, if both of them change by the same ratio, that is okay. Means that we can still keep the ratio constant, which is we want to be almost one. But if it is not, so what will happen is that effect of pull is not cancelled. So therefore, it's like that you have a system, say for example, <coughs> this is generic, not only about circuits, any linear system, but we talk about circuits. Suppose you have a circuit of which the open loop uh, gain is the, given by this relation. <coughs> so S0 is a 0 and the pole, dominant pole is P1. And the second pole is P2. So in this system, if we can suppose P1, P2, and S0 all are real. And therefore, if we can keep P2 equal to S0, suppose ideal scenario is this. So ideal case is, okay, we try to keep S0 equal to P2. And therefore, system or circuit becomes a first order circuit or system and therefore in fact we will get 90 degree phase margin and the unit gain frequency is determined by the uh, low uh, gain bandwidth product almost which is the low frequency gain AV0 multiplied by the dominant pole which is P1. So this is the desirable situation and we do not have any issue with the stability <coughs> which is fine. The only point is that it is not always we can make this relation. This relation is difficult to achieve. So therefore, we will reach to the situation we have a 0 almost is P2, not exactly equal to P2. <coughs> so if we have this situation, still it does not mean that we are not able to use this technique, but only we have to be careful. There is no cancellation here and there is a percentage of difference between S2 and S0 and P2. So, depending on the percentage of difference, for example, at what particular scenario, at a particular corner, process corner variation, at a particular temperature, this difference or ratio of P, S0 and P, P2, which was supposed to be 1, now is either less than 1 or more than 1. But that ratio will have its mean or max value, which is maximum deviation from 1 at some condition, some process condition. Now, if we have this case, that means that at the beginning, if you have a system which is only one pole, so therefore, after applying feedback, so your, system, your pole, you know that will move to this location. So, of course, if you apply your feedback factor is beta, so this is your loop gain. If beta is 1, which is maximum assuming beta does not go beyond 1. So, it is P1 A0. If beta is less than 1, so P1 will increase less. So, that leads to enhancement in the speed of the circuit because effectively bandwidth of the circuit increases. And this is very common for any linear feedback system. But therefore, therefore, the time constant of the system is determined by this. Means that the main time constant of the system is 1 upon P1 AV0 into beta. And this is, of course, open loop gain that we call it T0. So, therefore, system also becomes fat and, uh, fast. And this is property of the uh, linear feedback systems. But now what will happen is if we have P2 also, therefore, the closed loop, Therefore, this is the pole of closed loop. Closed 
closed loop pool if S0 is equal to P2. But closed loop pools, now there won't be closed loop pool, so there will be closed loop pools when S0 is not P2. But S0 is close to P2. Anyway, we don't have that kind of design when the ratio of them, suppose for example, becomes 1 upon 100, far away from each other. It's not. So they are close to each other, but not exactly the same. So therefore, now we don't have one closed loop pool. System is a second order system. Therefore, closed loop system also will remain second order, assuming beta uh, is constant with respect to frequency, simple case. So therefore, the second order behavior of the system will remain. That means that the closed loop system now will have two poles. Not only this pole, but also one more pole. And that pole is determined by P2, because now P2 is not cancelled. So now the question is, what is the effect of that? So if you want, I can write analysis for you. So I will just tell you how to write analysis. So this is AVS, which is the open loop unit. So suppose I don't cancel S0 and P2, therefore I want to see what happens for the closed loop gain. That is the question. The question is what would be the impact of a non-ideal cancellation, which means that S0 is not exactly P2. So therefore I will write closed loop gain. F means with feedback. So closed loop gain will be open loop gain divided by 1 plus loop gain. So open loop gain is AV0 into 1 plus S by S0 write it here then I will replace directly. So it is AV S1 one, one plus beta AVS. I'm writing that. So knowing that, I will get this. In fact, if you divide denominator and numerator by 1 plus s by p1 into 1 plus s by p2, you will get this. So from this relation, we reach here. So if we simplify, so we will get p1, p2 at the numerator and We will have S square plus S into P1 plus P2 plus beta AV0, P1, P2, S0. This is the coefficient of S plus constant term I write here, beta AV0 plus 1 into P1. So these are location of new poles. So we have two poles now. So and you can by a very good approximation you assume beta AV0 is much more than 1. And we deal with positive numbers. It's a positive uh, negative feedback. So beta AV0 is most positive. That means that if AV0 is negative, beta has to be negative to make the multiplication positive. If AV0 is positive, beta should be positive. So this is, this means in both cases we will have negative feedback. So now the question, because the reason I'm saying this is that because then you can simplify this relation. Okay, so now here we want to make some approximations.
So, here specifically, so you will get two poles and these two poles will contribute to the delay of the system. See, it is not just a matter of phase margin. As I told you, we have to also be careful about the large signal behavior. So, now here what will happen though this is even a small signal behavior, it will have its own impact. So, because we have two poles and we expect one of the poles now become close to this dominant pole which is P1 into T0. We expect one pole to be close to this new P1 <coughs> that we call it P1 after feedback P1F. So, we expect one of them to become close to this pole and the question is where will be the location of second pole. See that depends. So, look therefore, the, we have a second pole and that second pole will create problem for us if for example, you can go with different conditions or with different assumptions. One thing is that see, if I have a system in which I can cancel a pole with a zero almost and I do not have any other pole, so what does that or other poles are far away. That means that I can simply decide about A V zero because I can increase A V zero keeping P1 constant and then therefore this A V zero P1 get, just gets increased. And I'm not for it. Even a v zero p one becomes close to p two because I know that suppose if p two remains as it is, I know that anyway it gets cancelled. So I'm not so worried. Means that the unit gain frequency is not required to be at p two anymore because I'm cancelling p two with a zero. So p two doesn't exist. Therefore, even I can go farther, right? Suppose for example, if I tell you, look. I have this situation, I can make a 0 almost equal to P2, therefore I can allow this closed loop gain to go far away from P2, closed loop gain, closed loop pole which is unit again frequency of open loop transfer function. This suppose goes very high, even it crosses P2, it goes even much higher than P2. Then it is very interesting, that means that I can get a very high unit again bandwidth or a very high pole, closed loop pole. The question is, is that correct or not? Let me just consider that a special case, which looks very fantastic. In fact, let us just focus on that fantastic case and see what happens for that fantastic case. <coughs> assume somebody designs, sub, assume like a designer, okay, does this. A designer chooses new look game new pole which is P1 into T0 which is unit again frequency of closed open loop is much larger than P2 because we do not need to make unit again frequency on P2 anymore because P2 will get cancelled therefore we know that in open loop there is no P2 so therefore effectively a designer says okay so I choose what is the problem with that if we have a mismatch okay so with this assumption we go ahead and because see the beta AV0 is much more than the 1, this is T0. Whenever I have 1 plus T0, I consider it almost T0. This is a very valid assumption. So, you keep this in mind. That is why I do not deal with 1 plus T0, is T0. So, therefore, this is the assumption. So, now what do we get in this case? So, I call the location of poles with feedback P1F and P2F. So, what is the summation of them is the coefficient of S. So, I have written S in this form. So, therefore, these are directly log of, uh, coefficient of S will be addition of poles. I have not written in the form of A square plus BS plus Y. So, therefore, it is not 1 upon P, it is P. So, therefore, I will get <coughs> summation of them which is P1 which is P2 plus P1 into 1 plus T0 P2 by S0 because they are not cancelling, getting cancelled P2 and S0 and then multiplication.
So I have assumed T0 also is much more than. So I have now, I want to find out the location of holes. <coughs> Considering I know P1, T0 is much more than P2. So therefore now look, uh, if I assume that because P2 was getting cancelled by P1, uh, by S0, or where they are very close, therefore it's very likely that we will have a dominant pole after applying feedback as well. So therefore, if you have that case, therefore that means that the summation of these poles is See, this is uh, this is in that form, right? So it is in this form. S plus P one F into S plus P two. S in this way. So their summation becomes coefficient of S, their multiplication becomes the constant. This one. See, you just keep this equal to this term. To make it common, just make this equal to that. That's it. No, 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 no. That that's why I'm saying that there are two cases. Okay, let's explain on a separate paper. You can write in the form of a square plus b s plus one. You can write in the form of S square plus C S plus D. You can make the constant and one, you can make coefficient of S square plus one. So if you make in that way, so this is equal to S plus say alpha into S plus beta. Right? Coefficient of S is equal. Here constant is one. Therefore it is in the form of one upon S by alpha into 1 upon s by beta. Therefore, here coefficient of s is inverse of summation of poles. The other case is the summation of poles. That clear? <coughs> okay. Okay, and then I know that also that S0 is almost P2. So therefore, from here I conclude that P1F plus P2F, which is the summation of ports in the feedback mode, of course minus summation of ports, is almost P1, because P2 is almost S0, therefore it is almost P1 T0 plus P2. And already I have considered P1 T0 is much more than P2, therefore this is almost P1 T0. So this is summation of poles. And multiplication of poles will remain same as before. I purposefully write it in that way. See, compare these two. Summation of poles and multiplication is given. Therefore, P1F is P1, T0 and P2F is P2. Okay, now you tell me what do you conclude from the location of poles in the feedback. First of all, we don't have one pole. We have two poles. One of them is the pole we expect, P1 into T0. But we have the second pole almost unchanged. I am going with that condition of fantastic condition of making loop gain is much more than P2. Exactly. 
That's the problem. Now you have a closed loop system with P2 as a dominant pole, not P1T0. Because P1T0, I, as a designer, I wanted to keep it much more than P2. P2 will remain. P2 will remain, of course. In the closed loop transfer function, still I have a zero. Therefore, for a very small range of the frequency. The point is that if this mismatch between P2 and S0 cannot be controlled very well, and it's some corners or some condition of process variation, this ratio differs from 1 by a significant or not negligible, let's not call it significant, let's say that not negligible range value, then actually your dominant pole becomes P2, and the time constant of the system is controlled by P2. And therefore, system will have a long settling time. That is the reason. This is called doublet. And that's why it's called that if this is very important in doublet situation. If you don't have a good matching between pole and zero, you may end up actually with a very large settling time. Even for this nice case, when we wanted to keep it much more than we do. Is that you want to keep it, but closed loop pole will remain. So that is the reason. This will create delay. In fact, now you have a time constant associated with P2, which makes the system slow. That is the only point. Otherwise, definitely this technique is useful and is used. We don't make P2, uh, 0 at P2. Okay, that is the situation. Yes. In that case, why P2 won't harm That is the case we discussed, right? Like a 0 is almost. A zero is almost P2. Oh, you mean that you are a situation when actually you don't have this. Yeah. For example, common source amplifier. Yeah. In that case, my, uh, in then I don't go with this condition. See, if I know that P2 is, and a zero is far away from each other, for example, in common source condition. Suppose location of a zero is in fact further from P2. So I have P1, then I have P2, then I have a zero. That is under, say, and all of them are real. In that case, this condition is not valid. The condition I made. This condition. Because if I have that situation, I never keep the unity gain frequency much more than P2 because phase margin will have problem. In that case, I will make P1, T0 close to P2. So I, I wanted to give a condition that you think you will get a very fantastic case when you can go even beyond P2, make your mega unit again beyond P2, but what will happen then P2 becomes your dominant point. Exactly. Okay. Uh, uh, it depends how much mismatch you can have between P0 and P2 and S0. If that mismatch, means that ratio should be 1, they should be exactly the same. But suppose there is a mismatch. Suppose it 0 becomes, say, 70% of P2 in some condition. Then it may not be a correct choice. Actually, okay, we have also to talk about whether it is lead or it is lag. If it is lead, it might be better. But if it is lag, it may not have effect. Lag in the sense that in lead in the sense that first you will have zero and then you will have pole. Like means that you will have pole and then you will have zero. When you have first zero, then it will help to improve the phase and then will enhance also the unit again bandwidth. It, it, we have to see which one of these two cases. <laughs> but I just want to say, you suppose if the, well, one of them becomes 95% of the other one, and that, that should be okay, not too much problem. But when you go with, say, 70%, let's assume that the pole is 70% of the zero, it will make first pole, maybe. And also, the point is that how far you want to go also. That's the question. This was like a very extreme case I consider, but practically, you may not go with this case. So therefore, you will limit the bandwidth. You will not go really to make it much more than P2. But that is ideal case when I have a pole. I have just a single pole. I have no. I don't have limitation. So I can go beyond P2. As long as I'm not very close to the third pole. In fact, you assume this is an approximation of a multipole system, which is happening in the case of op-amps. 
So if I want to go beyond P2 by full zero cancellation, I can do that, provided I'm not going much closer to the third pole. Therefore, this condition is valid for a multipole system. I can use it, provided I keep this P1, T0 much less than the P3. Not much less than, but enough less than P3, as for, depending on the phase margin I want. So here is not a question of compensation. Compensation will be okay. Means that in both cases, you may not get a very bad phase margin. But uh, the point is settling time now will change. Your system will not be as fast as you expect because of the effect of this P2. Means that system still may be stable. You may have a lead lag or lag lead compensation situation, even if S0 and P2 are not very close. But uh, anyway, P2 will remain, and that's why that will create problem in the settling time. Only. That's why we need to see always these two together. We cannot just see one of them. If you just see the transfer function and you see the phase margin, you see it's okay even if they are mismatched by some percentage. But when you go to the time domain, and you, in many cases, a pump is used for very precise applications. Therefore, settling time means that the output of a pump has, has to settle less than 1% of its final, 1% uh, error within the final value. So therefore, it's not like that you can just say that, okay, three time constant is good enough for me. You have to wait till it goes below 1% of the, below 1% within the margin of the final value. So that's why this settling time gets, that's why they don't call it delay, they call it settling time. Because settling time now will very much dependent on P2. <coughs> because it looks like, of course, P2 is your dominant pole, but the point is that you have a zero close to that. Therefore, it doesn't create too much problem in the transfer function or maybe even first margin. But it will create problem in the settling. Effectively, you have a term in the, so I call it tau 2, and tau 2 is 1 upon P2. And the coefficient of this, let's call this coefficient, for example, W. This W depends on the ratio of S0 by P2. Suppose if S0 by P2 is 1, W becomes 0. So if S0 by P2 is 1, then W will be zero. So more percent, percentage of difference between S0 and P2, you will have larger W, and you will have more effect of this term as compared to other terms in the transient behavior of the circuit, and therefore settling time will get affected. This will create a transient term in your, and this tau is large as compared to tau associated with this pole, and therefore, this will take time. Okay, so therefore, in doublet, uh, the problem mainly is because of settling time, really, not because of the phase margin. And you may get reasonably good phase margin even in both cases, when P2 is less than S0 a little or when P2 is a little more than S0. But uh, only depending on application, this has to be taken care. That's why if you go with this technique, you need definitely measure the settling time of the system. Means that the op amp or the system you have in the closed loop mode. So we reached here in the last lecture. <coughs> the problem was, so we found that we can use Miller theorem and then uh, use a relatively small capacitor to achieve a required capacitor for sh uh, moving the dominant pole to the, uh, towards the J omega axis so that we would be able to get a proper phase margin and also we understood that the location of second pole 
actually moves in the sense that now we will have pole splitting therefore omega unit again will be better or more as compared to the case we do not have pole splitting and omega unit again will be less than d2. What is the relation between omega unit again and omega minus 3 db? This is for open loop. <coughs> condition this is for closed loop condition so you can consider effect of theta and consider whether you have one pole or two poles And in the case of two poles for the open loop condition, you assume that compensation is in such a way that you want to go with the same thing that we consider that omega unity phase margin will be quite large, for example, more than 55 degrees. So I'm not making it very large, but suppose at least I want this kind of phase margin. What would be the relation between these two? In two cases, either you have one pole or you have two poles with this condition and beta is a number which is the feedback factor more than zero less than one at most equal to one so you consider this two and then see around that as a function of beta and for these two conditions Because uh, I purposefully talked about this when I was uh, explaining the effect of mismatch between S0 and P2, but nobody asked a question. So I was expecting you say that, how do you consider this two to be equal? And then at what condition? But nobody asked, so I assumed you know that. So if you say you know that, you don't ask, so therefore you give this answer. This is a question. Okay, I'm not saying it will come, but it may be a part of this. One of the questions. Okay, the problem was with this compensation, pole splitting was the positive aspect, which was fine. The problem was with the model of this system. This system, we modeled it as a second order system. Then we had a two port model, R1, C1, C2 in the feedback, R2, C3 at the output port. And then the point is that this CC was connected between gate and ring or effectively in this case it's a common source connected but in that case eventually it was connected between input and output of the second stage and here m9 is assumed to be the second stage which is a common source so the problem was there was a zero and that zero was a right half plane zero and because of right half plane zero we get a negative phase and therefore phase margin degraded and therefore this had negative impact on the controlling phase margin. Therefore, we want to shift this zero to a very high frequency. Uh, uh, sorry, we want to shift it to the left half plane. That can be easily done by just adding a resistor. But this resistor will not be fixed across corners. Therefore, we have to make sure that for all process corners, always this denominator is negative. Means that Rz is enough larger than 1 upon gm9 for general model that we had in the last lecture, two port model, GM9 is same as, same as GM2, capital GM2. So therefore, we have to make sure that Rz is more than the minimum value of one upon GM, one upon minimum value of GM. And therefore, that means that Rz should be chosen enough large. And then that means that unnecessarily we are adding to the area if this Rz is a passive resistor, and also, it will add its own parasitic capacitances to both nodes, 
nodes on the left and nodes on the right side of this RZ, two terminals. So therefore, this we have to uh, control. So one way. The rain bulk that is will be here. Drain gate, yes, yes, but CC is pretty large. The CC is much larger than that drain gate. It's very unlikely. If you have such a small CC, which is very unlikely, that means that your system is a single pole system. It's very difficult to get a single pole system with this kind of configurations. So it's very unlikely to happen. CGD will not have a significant. This CC is in the range of at least one or two picofarad. And this CGD is in the range of from two for us. It's very unlikely. <laughs> yeah, but that pool is not very uh, small. That pool will not be very small. That's a good question. Very good question. Why you don't uh, look at that? Because when you add uh, RZ, so what you have now, you have three capacitors. You have a third order system. So therefore, it's, therefore it is likely you will have another pole. So now what will be the third pole which is added? Yeah, that's a good question. One pole which is the dominant pole of course is still is similar to the previous case. But you will have two more poles, yes. Yes, you will have a third pole also. The question is that if CC is not very small, what will be the effect of adding RZ? Because it will shift to zero to the left, which is in favor of what we want. But then it will add one more pole. And that pole, if it is a function of CC, that actually may become low. That is a good question. It's not associated with CC. The point is that uh, this CC, also contributes to the location of poles. It may not be just a component of dominant pole. It may become a component of a non-dominant pole as well. That's the question. Of course, it may also remain a component of only dominant pole, like similar to the case we have for RZ. CCC becomes also a component of non-dominant pole as we derived last time. So you had, what was the location of dominant pole? If I consider this case when RZ is zero, it was GM9 uh, CC upon uh, CECC plus CECL plus CCCL. So CC still is, was there. But if you uh, remember, if, CC, if we increase CC, actually the location of that pole was increasing rather than reducing. It doesn't come to the, you know, uh, mind when you look at it, you think that if you increase CC, location of second pole also should reduce. That is the pole splitting. So means that CC always doesn't have a negative feedback, reducing poles. It was reducing the dominant pole, but it was increasing the non-dominant pole. And if CC is too large, its effect after some time gets vanished. Means that it doesn't contribute to the other poles at, at all. And that is because CC becomes short at higher frequencies. So the question is whether that situation remains here or not. For example, that pole splitting which was happening, will it continue to happen? Or whether this new pole will be a stronger function of CC with a less pole splitting effect? That's the question. How do you compare it with the case that there was no RZ? For example, what about pole splitting? And also what about the third pole? Because in this case, you have three poles rather than two poles. Yeah, that's a good question. Let's keep it also as the second question. So we have the quiz questions. So this is question one. No, of course, quiz is not about compensation. But fine, I can relate it to time constant. After all, these are all time constants. I will not ask you to compensate, but I can give you something which is used for compensation. But it is still related to time constant. Okay, so effect of RZ
one holes. Of course, one straightforward effect will be now system becomes a third order system and therefore we have three poles rather than two poles. The question is what will happen for the pole splitting and what will ha what will be the location of the third pole or at least can be estimated. Yeah, that's the question. Okay, we can use transistor if Rz is too large because we can use a transistor according to that we can control the bias voltage of Rz, adjust it in such a way that we will get resistor we want. Of course, this resistor will be realizable if I keep transistor in the ohmic region. Therefore, I have to make sure the transistor will be in ohmic region. Okay, so this is important. So I bias it into ohmic region, adjust it in such a way that it will be in ohmic region according to VB, and therefore I will get the required value of the resistor. So here, we replace, we can replace resistor RZ with a transistor and then control the value of effective equivalent value of this resistor, desirable resistor RZ by the size of transistor. But because see, that is very common approach. When you want a very large resistor, you can use a transistor with a very small aspect ratio. So and uh, you can control the size also by gate overdrive. So this VB also controls. And it is possible to relatively get smaller area, really enough smaller area as compared to the case we use passive resistors. The only point here is when you add resistor, transistor, other issues come to the picture. For example, when you have a passive resistor, the value of passive resistor doesn't change with swing. But as it is shown here, specifically this node X is connected through CC to this side. And this side is connected to the input. So this side may not have too much swing because this is coming from output of first stage. And first stage has some gain, but it's not too much. And it's directly connected at the input. So differential input is very small. So this swing may not be very large. Sometimes this swing is just less than even 50 millivolt. It depends, of course, on the gain and the final swing and the gain of second stage, but this is not too much. But here definitely you will have this is output of second stage, therefore it, the input has been enlarged enough so that you will get a significant swing here and a part of it will be at node X. Therefore VDS of this transistor which is in ohmic region is changing. And because VDS is changing, you may not get really exact value. Of course, again it depends how much is changing, but if the swing is large, that will create problem. Even if swing is too large, it may actually push it towards uh, outside triode region and take it out. And therefore, here that leads itself leads to problem. So therefore, the value of Rz itself now is changing with the swing. Now, when it's changing with the swing, in addition to the problem of not having a constant location, it may happen that actually you will be back to the right half plane. Because if Rz, for example, suppose, if Rz reduces, this will be back to the right of plane. And if Rz increases, so the location of 0 is changing. So as long as, of course, it is negative is okay, but it's not a fixed value. So location of 0 itself is changing with a swing. So this will lead to nonlinearity as long as the 0 is effective. So therefore, overall, this will be the problem. So we have to make sure that the swing at node X at least doesn't change the, doesn't shift it to the right of plane. And doesn't change, in, in fact, even doesn't change it to the scenario when it will not be in ohmic region at all. 
So this will be the problem. And of course, process variation effect still exists for transistor as well, because transistor also will change its parameters, including threshold voltage, mobility, and oxide thickness as a function of process variation, because there are many transistors, many lots, many runs in a foundry, and therefore it's not possible to make all transistors same. So therefore, one chip with respect to the other chip on the same wafer also will not show same behavior. So process variation is a problem for both of them. And if you use a constant voltage here, therefore that's why we don't want it. If you use a constant voltage VB here, if the VGS of M9 changes with the process, that means VGS of RZ will change. And if VGS of RZ changes, then means value of RZ will change. And therefore, again here, you have similar problem you had in the previous case. So we don't want to make this, if here this is a P-channel transistor, we SG of this transistor to be very uh, variable, because if it is variable, it may happen that actually we will end up to the case that VSG is pretty small and the transistor will be driven into uh, active region as well. So therefore, the whole behavior of the system will change. So here also we have same problem. The only advantage we got is the reducing area. So one way to at least get rid of this variation of VSG is that you bias this VB using similar P-channel transistors, which are used for M9 and M15. Similar, not actually they make them same. Similar in the sense that the bias voltage VB, which is equal to VDD minus drop across M9 and drop across VGS of RZ, which is M15. This drop and drop across M13 and M14 are equal according to this KVL. Therefore, that means that if there is a change, and another point is that it is, uh, it is also, try, we try that to keep this I1 and the current through M11 to be also, current through M11 to be a function of I1, even it is desirable even to be exactly same. If it is exactly same, for example, and then suppose these transistors have same size, Therefore, this VGS, VGS of M9 and VGS of M13 can be made same. And therefore, VGS of transistor M15 will be equal to VGS of transistor M14. Now, if there is a process and they start changing, so the same change you see in this transistor, you will see here. And therefore, the VGS of transistor will be controlled better. So, this is the advantage we get. In fact, okay, this is another technique. Uh, before going with that technique, in this technique, what we want to do is that we want to make the VGS of transistor M15 itself to be a function of difference of VGS of two separate P-channel transistors and cancel out all non-idealities, for example, variation of VT between M13 and M14 as well as M9. So therefore, you can think of different solutions. For example, if you write the KVL, and here is just the two VGS drop. So we can make this VGS exactly to remain even constant, independent of variation of VT. Because what is important, not VGS, sorry, gate overdrive, VGS minus VT. Because here, what you have is that the sub VGS of M13 plus M14 is equal to VGS of M9 plus M15. And both of them are biased by the similar current. That means that you can control the gate overdrive of these transistors to be equal. Now, if with the process, threshold voltage changes, if the current source can remain almost constant, then gate overdrive doesn't change. Because gate overdrive is determined by the current. And therefore, if threshold voltage changes, that means that the gate voltage, gate source voltage will change, not gate overdrive. And here, the value of resistor is determined by gate overdrive voltage, not gate source voltage. Therefore, gate overdrive voltage will remain constant, which will help to uh, control the value of RZ better. As compared to the case, we don't have this VB as a function of VT. For example, VB can be constant or VB 
Therefore, you should not generate VB, for example, from a band gap. That's the wrong approach. VB should not be a constant bias. VB should be in such a way that will give you always a constant overdrive across VGS of M15. Overdrive means that VGS minus absolute value of VGS minus absolute value of VT. Is that clear? This is a very common technique for biasing. Whenever you want to keep the VG, gate overdrive of a transistor constant and you have to use a voltage biasing rather than current biasing, you create a KVL loop like this. So that always transistor and then bias the transistor using same current. Therefore, you will get always a constant gate overdrive as long as current remains constant. That becomes independent of threshold voltage if you have this KVL loop. Because if this current is constant, gate overdrive of these transistors is always constant. It does not depend on the process. Of course, it will have up to some limit dependent on the process because of the mobility, but there are different techniques. For example, you can compensate effect of mobility as well. But here, assume here we are mainly concerned about the variation of threshold voltage, which is a very important. Threshold voltage is one of the most important parameters for the, in the variations. Therefore, if you can compensate the effect of that, that itself is in control on the process. Okay. So, I do not write details. Details are given in Razavi's book, Detail of Writing. The next, uh, just I give you the next technique because I want to finish this part. So the next te technique I have written the relation. The reason is because the left half circuit, the left circuit is not taught in the class. This is straightforward. You have two diode connected transistors, bias by I1. Therefore, now you can know that how to derive the VGS of transistor. That I should not write. It's just the current in the saturation region, and therefore you can get gate over the right as a function of I aspect ratio and mu C ox. But here. Uh, there is another technique and then I tell you what is that technique. See here the technique is I want to here instead of looking at keeping RZ constant here we are looking at this case. See this is what is this here? This is that the location of 0 is GM9 inverse minus RZ. So we want to try to control the location of 0 and make sure that if GM9 inverse minus RZ is some value suppose you design it. And because process variation, GM9 inverse changes by some percentage, RZ changes by some percentage. If I keep that same, therefore this difference again will remain constant. So that is the idea behind the next technique. So this technique says what it will do. It will try to make the ratio of GM9 and R, R yeah. Here it tries to make the, um, okay, so here we are back to RZ, yeah, here it's, uh, it tries to keep the ratio of RZ and 1 upon GM9 almost to be constant. How to do that? RZ is a passive resistor, so we, use, we are back to the passive resistor because we know that transistor also has its own problems. So here it does not try to solve the problem of area. Area is not solved. Here it tries to solve the problem of process variation if you use a passive resistor. So how to use this, solve this problem? We want to keep this difference relatively constant. We do not want to change them too much. So what we do is that R set is a passive resistor. Therefore, if we can make 1 upon GM9 also to be proportional to a passive resistor, Therefore, ratio of RZ and GM9 will be ratio of two passive resistors. And ratio of two passive resistors does not change with the process, with first order approximation. Because if you have R1 by R2, and they are of the same type, suppose both of them are polyresistors. Therefore, if R1 changes, say, by 5% to two process, the second one also will change by 5%. Therefore, ratio will, remains, will remain constant. So here what it tries to do is that to make GM equal proportional to some 1 upon GM proportional to some resistor, passive resistor, or GM proportional to inverse of a passive resistor. So this is the target. How to do that? See, it is very important to know that what determines GM of transistor? GM of transistor is determined by the bias current of a transistor. Now, if I have a circuit 
of which a bias current is proportional to one the, see this is IB the bias current in this circuit. So, this circuit is still I have not talked about it this is called constant GM circuit. It is used for biasing transistors, but assume this circuit is given and it is easy to prove that the current in this branch is given by this relation. What is this relation? It is 1 upon mu p c ox w by L of p. p means w by L of mb3 and mb4. This is Rs is this passive resistor kept here and K is the mirroring ratio between these two transistors. So, this circuit is a self bias circuit. You can see if you write a KVL in the, this loop, you will get a relation between MB3 and MB4 currents. If you write a current mirroring ratio between MB1 and MB2, you will get another relation between current of MB3 and MB4. So, you will get two equations and two variables which is IB3 and IB4. Therefore, you will get current in both of them. That's why this current is given by this K, this relation and this is easy to derive it, but of course, it is derived based on the square law relation. So, here transistor MB4 has a lower VSG as compared to MB3. Therefore, we expect this side to have less current as compared to this side. So, that's why mirroring ratio is not necessarily 1 and it is actually less than 1 from here to here. So, now having that k, k is from this side, right to left. So, k is more than 1 here, written here also. Okay, okay. So, this is another point. There are the two different ways to do that. Either you can change the mirroring ratio or you can change the sizing of this two transistor. Here MB3 and MB4 are not, are not sized by the same ratio. Aspect ratio of MB4 and aspect ratio of MB3 are not same. So if you have two transistors and then VGS of say M, VSG of MB4 is less than VSG of MB3. And if you want to keep current same, so here because mismatch is applied here rather than here. If you keep current same, you need to have higher aspect ratio for MB4 so that you would be able to make the current same. Because one of them has less gate overdrive. To have same current as other one aspect ratio should increase. Therefore, aspect ratio of MB4 should be more than MB3. And therefore, because of that, it's able to give you same current as IB. So here, the as mirroring ratio is kept constant. Okay. So therefore, K is the, I corrected K is the ratio of aspect ratio of MB4 and MB3, which is given here. And that has to be more than one so that MB4 is a bigger transistor, larger aspect ratio. It can give you less overdrive as compared to MB3 for a given bias current. So now if you do that, and this is, now this is called constant GM circuit, in fact this circuit. Why? See, GM of a transistor, if you look at the GM of this P-channel transistor, what is the GM? GM is determined by, if I want to write it as a function of aspect ratio and mu C ox, it is the square root of 2 mu C ox W by L, Vgs minus Vt square, right? And uh, sorry, and then I, sorry, yeah, the square root of 2Id W by L mu C ox, right? That is G. So I just write it here. Square root of 2Id mu C ox, I use P, W by L, P channel transistor, right? But what about bias current? Yes. No, this is passive, but still passive will have process variation. See, there are, we went with two solutions. One solution was to replace it with active. Active also has uh, the transistor problem of swing and problem of process variation. We try to overcome the problem of process variation, which is gate overdrive constant by using current source and that KVL, which was using the same P-channel transistors. But the still problem of swing is there. Therefore, we are back to the passive and say that, see, let's stay with passive, but we know that large area will be consumed. The only problem we have is process variation. So, therefore, we want to, add, the only, we are not actually adding a circuit. If you look at this, that is the advantage of this circuit. See, look, 
Anyway, you will need a bias current. This is a current source for M9. M9 is a common source transistor. You need to bias the current source. This is a common source with active load. Anyway, you need a current source generator. So this is not an additional module, actually. This is used as a basic current reference generator, which is IB, and IB value is given C. You can see this IB is not a function of EDD. It's not a function of anything. It's a self bias circuit. So it's a reference generator. So it generates an IB for you. IB is a function of RS square and this K. K is constant with respect to process. W by L is constant with respect to process. But mu, P, C, ox and RS change with the process. Therefore, this current source is not constant with respect to process. However, it will give you a constant GM in this transistor. That's why I want to show you why that this circuit is called constant GM rather than constant current. It's because it's not, first of all, constant current. Current changes with process, but it will give us a constant GM. Of course, it's not exactly also constant, but I just tell you, like, what do they mean? So this is GM of a P-channel transistor. And current I write here. So upon mu P C ox, W by L P, into 1 upon R S square, into 1 minus 1 upon square root K square. And K is ratio of aspect ratio of two p-channel transit. Now look, if I replace, what I will get? So this is 4. Mu p c ox will get cancelled, right? And then if suppose this is another transistor, so therefore I will call it, say for example, p dash. So that is not necessarily the same transistor. But uh, I just want to say if you bias it, P channel transistor using same current, what will happen? So mu P C ox will get cancelled. Now your GM is not a function of mu P C ox. So therefore you have reduced the effect of process and then you will get C ox also will get cancelled. So that also doesn't come to the picture. This will come out because this is 1 upon Rs. Square therefore this way, this is, yeah, IB. See, now what will happen is that this GM is only proportional to 1 upon RS. That is the only term, why they call it constant GM, actually is not constant GM. Means that if you use this bias current, you can bias transistors with a constant GM, but that GM still is a function of process variation of resistor but not a function of process variation of transistors. So therefore, GM is independent of variation of transistor parameters. Both transistors, transistors which are used for biasing, transistors, transistor which is used to generate GM, both. That's why I call them transistor, transistor's parameters. But look, now if I use this, so therefore now we know this relation. So therefore if I use this circuit to bias this M9, now GM of M9 becomes proportional to 1 upon Rs. So therefore, 1 upon GM is proportional to, and I have the compensation resistor of RZ. Therefore, 1 upon GM9 upon RZ is constant. That means that if RZ changes, 1 upon GM9 will change by the same factor. So now I have a better control on the location of zero. So this was, these were just two examples. Uh, so this technique also can be used. I'm not uh, ruling out this technique. And uh, specifically when area is a problem. The only point is that why I'm not so concerned about area or this technique is that because CC already is occupying area. 
Rz may or may not be much larger than CC depends on the condition of CC. But if during design, because you know the, for example, how much is the sheet resistance of say polyresistor. Polyresistors are more often specifically high sheet resistance polyresistor is available in the processes. So if you find that is large, say for example, if sheet resistance is say 20 K, it's pretty large. So you can use a passive resistor. But if sheet resistance is a small, say for example, less than 1 K, then area may really increase. And then in that case, you may prefer to go with a passive design rather than uh, uh, transistor based design rather than passive. The only problem here is this, you need to actually perform large signal analysis. For example, slowing mode, non-slowing mode when you apply the signal, measure nonlinearity, make sure that the ringing is not happening, circuit is stable because the location of this zero is changing. Or you design for the worst case. For the worst, worst case means that when this one upon GM9 has its own maximum value. You design for that case. If you design for that corner, then you will get the maximum RZ. The only problem is that now uh, you have to take care of area. That's why over design for over when we do over design, we get back to the transistor design. When we get back to the transistor design, then we have to re-examine this stability because because of the swing value of this resistor is changing, and in fact. Uh, slow rate itself also is changing. So because I mean, during slow rate you will see also ringing. During slowing you will see ringing even during large signal behavior. In fact that is also very interesting phenomenon which is happening because of these issues. But this was just an example and this circuit therefore is called a constant GM circuit. So till now if you remember wherever we had a current mirror we used the current reference which was ideal and then use a mirror. This itself now can generate a current for you. So you don't need really to use any uh, ideal current source anymore. So for your assignment also now you use this circuit. And this relation can be easily derived by just writing one KVL over here in this loop and considering currents are same. So in this case currents are same and then aspect ratio of MB3 and MB4 are different. Okay, but none of them solves the problem completely. That's the point. None of them gives you a very completely constant. Because one more thing also I tell you, here we, we ignore the effect of CC. CC itself changes with process. So therefore you have double problem. So and this one is resistor, one is capacitor. Therefore they are not correlated also. For example, one may increase, one may decrease. Both may increase, both may decrease. So therefore, they have their own corners almost uncorrelated. Therefore, variation of CC also will be another point. But one thing you can look is that the, how will be the ratio of zero and dominant pole, ratio of zero and non-dominant pole. Non-dominant pole is important for us. How the ratio of these two is changing with the process. This is also an interesting uh, question. So question three will be effectively, you know, because when you have the compensation and you shift it to the left. So for example, location of, no, I mean, I know, I thought you were right. I need to. Okay, so effectively, you know, effect of RZ and CC variation on location of zero. <laughs> of course, this is not independent of location of dominant pole, that's why I told you. Also consider variation of location of P 
because non because non dominant pool also may be a function of CC if CC is not very large. So these are interesting uh, questions. So please read this part from Razavi's book and then uh, if you have any question I can repeat it tomorrow before starting the next part.